Uh, we'll get. Well, I guess I guess we will officially get started because we are pressing record. <laughs> okay, I thought you're sorry, Dave. I thought you were ready to go. No, you're no, you're right. Um, <laughs> let me say this officially for the record. Then we are we are starting the July twenty second meeting of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Research Committee. Uh, so there may be a few more folks that join us, um, but. Thank you all for those that are here with us today. Um, so we do have a kind of brief agenda and, but we also know that we have um, a few folks specifically from the Prince George's County um, local group um, that we would especially like to, to hear from. Um, so I can, I'm gonna go ahead and share the, main agenda items in the chat just so we have those as a reference but i'll also be taking notes um while we're while we're in discussion here so bear with me on that All right, so I think we'll we can go ahead and start with welcome and introductions. I'm trying to keep that as as brief as possible. Um, but I am David Armenti. I am a commissioner and chair of the research committee. Um, I see we have several commissioners um, in the audience. So if you would like to announce yourself, and then we can hear from members of the public who can either state their name verbally or if you prefer to put in the chat, you can do that. Paul Snowden. Chris Haley, Maryland State Archives. Amy Millen, I'm also chair of the Logistics Committee for the commission. Trish Boyle, project manager with the OAD. Elizabeth Hughes, um, I serve on the commission. I'm the director of the Maryland Historical Trust. I'm not sure that I'm on this committee, but I wanted to sit in today since we've got some discussions about the Midshore hearing coming up, so. Brett Tyler with uh, Heritage Associates. Um, Donna Tyler is also on, but uh, She's having some technical difficulties with Google. Emily Squires, Assistant State Archivist at the Maryland State Archives. Thank you. Uh, any members of the public can either announce themselves or put their name in the chat. We'd appreciate that. I'll start from Prince George's. I'm the liaison to the uh, Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'm one of three co-chairs. One of the two is also here. She's introduced herself in the chat. I'll pass it on to another member who's here, Pat Neal. Yes, I'm Pat Neal and I'm uh, co-chair of the Education Committee of the Prince George's County Lynching Commission Project, Memorial Project. I don't know who the phone numbers are, so that may be it for Prince George's County Lynching Memorial Project. Nick, we're just introducing everybody. So I think you're it. Oh, uh, I'm Nick Creary. I'm the um, 
uh, representative on the commission of the Maryland Lynch Memorial Project, and I also chair the Reconciliation Committee. That's all I see, David. Okay, great. Um, so we did we did again want to um, thank our colleagues from the Prince George's Coalition for joining and and want to be cognizant of time here. So we we're hoping to since since you all took the time and and have been coordinating um, to hopefully take basically this first half of the meeting up to about three thirty um, to get a sense of what what uh you know what we can work on together um what what are the needs of the on the research and education side um at this time and you know maybe just to generally catch catch us up as a commission on on where the coalition is in in, it, in its work um so i don't know the best way to to do that um i don't know reverend tykert if if you maybe could set the stage for some of that or if that would be suitable uh yes let me see if emily demarco is on the call there's one phone number i don't recognize she is along with christina tucker who's able to listen but not speak um is our we have two people who have stepped forward to be the research team for planning our part of the public hearing um so since she hasn't said anything i know she had a complication this afternoon with a sick kitty um taking it to vet so i'll just say that we have been uh researching our four victims for several years now and we in the last year or two were coordinating with donna and brett um between our researchers assembling information i think i sent you the latest that i have david um from heritage plus our people and at this point we do not have descendants of victims or perpetrators known to us who are willing to speak uh yet that i know of unless donna or brett has come up with something in the last few months since i've reached out to them Unfortunately, Rem Packer, we have not. Now, that's that's certainly you know helpful baseline um, to confirm, and and we can we can certainly set that as a as a as a goal for the committee, um, and I, I think it's relevant to maybe to maybe to share that even though there hasn't been so we're we're in talks about a, a hearing for for prince george's county um of course um that would be done in collaboration but the the prince george's coalition itself has already put on some kind of commemorative events um uh related to the victims would would you mind uh kind of summarizing what has already occurred in that respect. I know there was at least one event. Yes, there's been one event and that was for the earliest of the documented lynchings, uh, lynching victims, Thomas Jurex, and that was April 15th, 2023. So um, we are actively researching the next one, which is John Henry Scott. Um, and that is moving along very slowly. We're trying to develop relationships in the community where he was lynched, just like we did with Thomas Jerks. It takes a while, plus doing the genealogical research. Um, I don't know if Christina is able to add anything in the chat because she is co-chair of the, um, she's chair of our uh, history and genealogical genealogy committee but i see she's not so i guess that's all i can tell you the plan until we knew about the public hearing taking place in february was to keep researching john henry scott and then 
do a tour of sites related to his lynching like we did for Thomas Jurek's and probably presentation at the library, one of the libraries nearby about the story to make connections and friends in the neighborhood. And here's something from Christina. The other researchers, 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 you can all read it in the chat. I'm not good at reading it out loud. Right. We have a very active chapter of OGS as it goes by. And Pat Neal, who's here today, is currently the president of it. Do you want to add anything, Pat? Do you know anything more than either Christina or I? No, just that they're still researching. And we are reaching out to the community to do some community events, some church visits, trying to get a feel of the area in Prince George's County, the Upper Marlboro area, and the Oxen Hill to bring more of, you know, a history and sense to the hearing. So in, in identifying um, Upper Marlboro and, um, excuse me, Oxen Hill, um, is that is that with the focus on, I think you said the John Henry Scott as the next kind of focus mm -hmm. for, for your committee? So that's the specific community that he would have been from or, or possible family connections? Yes, as far as we know. Okay. And the other two were lynched in Upper, upper Marlboro, uh, right. same area. Yeah. I think John Henry's from Oxen Hill and I think Stephen Williams and Michael Green are from Oxen Hill right near the old courthouse where they were lynched. I think you mean Upper Marlboro, right? Upper Oh, yes. Yeah. So if Brett and Donna are able to come up with anything more, we're certainly be very grateful. Otherwise, we understand, along with Chris Haley, as he so eloquently has said, that sometimes there aren't descendants, especially of victims, yeah. who want to speak, I mean. And yeah, and along with that, I know part of our work as a commission and, you know, part of developing appropriate processes for, for outreach, that's been an ongoing discussion, you know, amongst the full commission as well as the leadership. So I know something we've been in communication with um, is about, you know, when you have a lead on an individual uh, for, genealogical research, um, you know, who should be reaching out to individuals, um, things like that. So um, we certainly want to be in partnership on that process and and where where needed, you know, lend that, you know, some something as as simple as having, you know, commission letterhead, um, state letterhead on communications, having the chair sign it. So you know, that's that's more just a matter of, of process and, and something that we should be thinking about um, as potential community members or descendants get identified. Um, so just making making note of that that goal again of obviously trying to have descendant participation in the hearings is is ideal. Um, though of course, like you said, we we would go on even if we weren't able to do so um so that's certainly that'll certainly be on the docket here uh i would could i add something uh our researchers the ones who are prince george's augs members they are accustomed to following all the leads they can come up with and reaching out to the individuals that they identify who are still alive um and so uh, am I hearing you say that that step of reaching out to someone who is living is you don't want our researchers to take that step? Or are you just saying the invitation to speak at a public hearing should be retained by the commission? Yeah, I don't think, and I definitely welcome my colleagues to jump in. I think my point was more that the the process has been discussed 
um, as a commission and we have, we've had different strategies. Um, so I'm not saying one way or the other that the, you know, coalition members should not be doing that or should be doing that, uh, more so that if there is some question of whether it um, has been effective or whether it should have a different voice attached to it, that that we should be in coordination on that discussion. Because I think we've seen varied levels of success or lack of success um, with different iterations of people reaching out. So there hasn't been kind of a, a, a template that has, has been generally um, across the board. So yeah, just I would just be in touch with us during that process and, and see what, what makes the most sense. But yeah, uh, Dr. Creary. Uh, yeah, as, uh, my recollection is that, um, you know, for example, with Frederick, um, you know, Dean Heron, you know, worked very closely with, you know, the, the commission, um, but was also instrumental, you know, for the, um, you know, for the local coalition, for the local group that we had together. So, yeah, I mean, to the extent that you have people engaging in this work, yes, by all means, keep that going, reach out to them however you think is appropriate. Um, you know, have, have them, you know, sort of, you know, stay in touch with us and again, collaborate with us. But yes, the official invitation to, to anyone to, to speak at the hearing, that will come from the commission. You know, that was something, you know, again, sort of hard fought, you know, hard learned lessons, but, you know, we need to retain that for the commission, you know, so that, you know, we can not so much control things as much as just to make sure that we know who is coming and also have a reasonably good idea of what it is people are going to be saying, because that, you know, had been an issue before so again it's just it's a matter of just making sure you know protecting the integrity of the you know of the entire hearing process right guys eat your hands up right brett isn't it oh mute it yes um this doesn't relate to the hearing directly but i just received a call from Donna who reminded me that we do have some information on uh, Scott. Uh, according to one newspaper article that we uncovered, he was also known as Jerry Scott, which uh, we're going to be researching. You may have that already, Pat. And uh, we also have a report, and I forget the source, it may have been the same article that he was owned. He had been owned by a Posey family, P-O-S-E-Y uh, family, and uh, I don't know if you'd uncovered that as well. I can send you, Reverend Tyker, I'll send you a, a note after this. Okay, and I'll pass it on to Pat and okay. Christina. And All could right. you spell how he spelled Jerry? I believe it was J-E-R-R-Y. Okay, thank you. So while we've we've identified the you know descendant identification as a as a priority here, I, I want to also be clear that that other aspects of the research that if 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 you feel that there's maybe access that folks within the commission might have that others may not that we can you know facilitate um, connecting with. You know a certain repository or you know anything along those lines um we, we want to have that be kind of a broad broad invitation for asks um you know considering the various uh organizations that are represented within the commission um state archives other and otherwise so uh keep that in mind as well but again appreciate the work that's already been done and you know any sort of guidance about how we can be most useful in the collaboration uh amy yeah just before we complete um our work with uh conversation with prince george's county um 
as the research is being done and as um, sort of the hearing announcement is sent out more publicly, the press releases, there can be include language that if somebody is a descendant, has heard the story of the lynching victims, that you know maybe their great, great, great grandparents were present or, or were young children at the time, et cetera, and the story has been passed down. So that's a community descendant. And um, so that is also somebody that could potentially provide testimony in that descendant sort of time frame of the run of show. So while not a direct lineal descendant, they're a community descendant. And there are folks out there who, you know, remember sitting under the kitchen table, hearing the adults talk. Like we've heard those stories across other counties. Um, so maybe Trish, um, as we're working with the Hatcher Group with marketing to make sure that there's sort of an invitation for for folks who may have heard, you know, know through their through their family stories or community stories to come forward, not just direct descendants. Especially for Prince George George's County, this could be especially valuable extra invite. Yes, that is correct. Um, we had our preliminary meeting with the Hatcher Group. Um, and we have been able to provide them with the date for the upcoming hearing that will be held in January um, for this particular role for Prince George's County group. Um, and we also did let them know that although there may not be identified descendants, there may be community descendants. And they also said that that is OK. Yes, for up, Diane, we see your hands up. Um, more than it would be okay, will they um, do what Amy suggested and invite uh, persons who are descendants of those who were present at onlookers at, in the community? At yes. The okay. Yeah, so we can definitely frame um, the wording to be as such. If folks want to be able to provide their testimony directly to say state archives, um, we already know that we already receive incoming information all the time, but we can definitely frame the marketing, marketing to be Right. Pat? Pat has her uh, right. Yeah, I was just wondering as we go along um, in planning, who will actually be presenting the four lynching victims at the hearing? Will we have a role in that or does that come from the commission? And when will we receive all the information so that everyone's on the same page as to what we have on each of the lynching victims? Do we need to present any fact sheets or more or less what else can we do to work with you on this? Uh I'm going to jump in as logistics chair, and that is those all those questions will be worked out with your commission liaison. So that would be Maya and Lindsay specifically. Um, and I don't have your next meeting date scheduled, but I feel like it's next week, maybe. So that I, you know, I, would, I think those questions are really important, especially at this stage as we're as we're sort of building out that. Um, but it could be um, a, a, somebody who's a, an historian. I mean, I think we already talked about some names specifically, and that sort of lives with your commissioner liaisons. But that I'm, not I'm not dodging the question. I'm trying to keep our conversation, since this is the research committee, and that's more of the logistics space. Yeah. Nick, uh, Dr. Perry. Sure. Sorry. So, so formal. Um, no, to, to the extent, I mean, a lot of that is going to really depend on what you as a local coalition wants to do. Different coalitions have done things differently. With Frederick, for example, they really wanted to have local people, you know, prominent in the presentation of the material on the, on the victims. Um, you know, as I said, other other coalitions have have done it differently. So it's it's pretty much what you want to do and what you're able to work out with 
local folks work out with you know your liaisons and with the the commission as a whole um i i would be all for you know tech if you have people in mind that you know that you want to do this i figure you're going to be at Bowie State. I know several historians there who would be wonderful people. You know, and I know uh, Professor Gina Lewis is is involved with the the local coalition, so she might be able to, if not do a presentation, but you know, kind of help you find people who want to do those presentations for you. You know, yeah. I mean, I think it's it, it's the stuff of good conversation to have. Pat, did you mean to have your, your hand still up? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, do okay. All right, thank you. Thank you again for, for joining. Um, and that discussion. So uh, certainly uh, Reverend Teichert working as the liaison um, knows where to find us. So if there are additional questions or uh, suggestions um, as far as next steps in the process. And I think I also saw in the chat that there is a another hearing planning meeting. So that that will kind of go hand in hand with, with some of the, the needs um, that would be identified um but good to know what what our our tasks are here um on the commission side and we'll certainly be in touch about that and just to confirm again uh amy we have january 25th is that what i am understanding yep mm -hmm. great all right and for the research um folks that should be the last hearing last county hearing. We're not going to go beyond that date. <laughs> well, we're, we're trying to get Carol and Howard figured out, but uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully that will be the last one. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> Do you like me to share the dates for the other known for the other hearings at this point just so that donna and brett have it front and center absolutely that would be yeah i was going to do that but please do okay so october 5th is montgomery county no and i can put this in the chat when i'm done reading i just can't do two things at once november 16th is kent caroline and queen anne's as a regional hearing uh, did I say December 7th for that? November 16th is St. Mary's Calvert with Charles as, um, even though Charles County doesn't have any known racial terror lynchings, they're sort of partnering in the work. So really focusing on St. Mary's and Calvert there. Um, I'm meeting this afternoon with Harford and Cecil County. So hopefully we'll have another date in a few hours. Um, for, for that hearing. And then as Nick just indicated, um, Howard and Carroll County are in the works. So. Amy, could you repeat for me the, um, the November 16th date yeah, I'm sorry. I, I My order got goofed up because my eyes jumped. November 16th is St. Mary's and Calvert, plus Charles as sort of a partner in that conversation. Okay. And I'm... There's a shorthand list I just put in the chat. Great. Thank you. I would imagine um, in preliminary conversations with Harford and, and Cecil, they're looking at a fall, sort of late September, October hearing. So they would be on the front end as well. And um, my understanding is that they've done quite a bit of work, um, both research and other work. So um, 
you know, we should be able to move fairly rapidly with that one. I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the one that I was, one that I was hoping to lift up here, um, not because it's one of the more immediate, but because there's been more kind of communication um, around potential descendants, as well as uh, additional newspaper research that that's been shared um, just just today, actually, uh, by Commissioner Hughes. Um, but looking at the upper, or I guess we're calling it the midshore, um, Queen Anne's County, Caroline County, um, those are, uh, excuse me, and Kent. Um, the we had we received communication from from an individual uh who is supposed to be a, a descendant of asbury green um who is the one of the victims from queen anne's county um so um, i had shared that with the committee here um, as well as a few other folks um, on the commission and I haven't I haven't received any follow up uh, from that individual. It was it was an email communication, and it was as I recall, it was very very simply, um, I am a I am a direct descendant um, of Asbury Green, uh, so I am. That's that's on my list to to follow up again uh, with that individual and and see a what kind of. Uh, potential uh, research or uh, materials are related to that, um, but also to, you know, start a conversation around hearing participation. Uh, yes, Brett. You're muted. I don't think I sent you an email, uh, David, but we um, contacted Miss Tina Sewell who is a uh, documented descendant, and she talked to some of her family members, and I believe the person who contacted you was Evans. <clears throat> Last name was Evans, I think. But in any event, uh, Tina did get back to me and say that some of the elders in her family seemed to recall the name and think that she was definitely a relative, but they were not certain about her being a descendant of Asbury Green. So uh, we're going to be doing some more uh, looking into that as well. Got it. That is that is good context to know. Um, and so is that, hopefully hopefully that name is familiar to um, other commissioners on the call. I know that's been an ongoing conversation uh, with most primarily with members of Heritage Associates. So I would I would just flag that maybe for you, Amy. And if that's, especially if that's a name you haven't heard before, um, we can follow up with that kind of level of confirmation. But yeah, Brett, I think you, you've been in communication with with Ms. Sewell for, for some amount of time, maybe not years, but but certainly months. Um, so we can, we can share that information a little bit more widely. Um, and yes, I think the individual I think you're talking about the same individual I am. I didn't cross-reference the name um, in preparation for this meeting, which I should have. But I think the other thing about what you just said, and, and we've seen this in other hearings, um, is the idea of collateral descendants. So just because somebody is not a direct descendant um, does not preclude them from uh, certainly participating or you know, having that that family connection, um, especially since some of the some of the victims did not have or were not known to have direct descendants, and we we certainly want to um, provide that opportunity for other individuals. So, yeah, let us let us know. Certainly, keep the committee updated um, as as you see what you can find from a genealogical perspective, and and like I said, I'll try to. I believe. I believe I responded maybe a few weeks ago and still haven't heard back. 
Um, so that'll that'll be that'll be my goal to to try to you know stimulate uh, connection with that individual again. While we're on the midshore, um, I was just going to ask, and Elizabeth is the commission liaison to that region. Elizabeth, is there anything specifically you want to ask before we move ship regions? Well, I guess I just need to get a better handle on of the one, two, three, four, I believe, victims from that area. I was thinking it was five, but I realized one of those on the map on the MSA website was a white man, which wouldn't uh, be part of this. Um, the extent to which we had identified any uh, descendants or collateral descendants, if not direct descendants. So I can follow up on that offline just to be caught up to speed, because I think when we have our next planning meeting with folks uh, from that area, uh, to talk about location for the hearing as well as just the logistical sort of framework for who speakers might be and, and all, the run of show and that sort of thing. It would be good to have that information to the extent that we know at this point. A lot can happen between now and December, I realize. So, um, but I can get that off offline. Thanks. Absolutely. And there is a a working document um a spreadsheet i believe uh that that heritage associates uh created that has kind of the working list of descendant outreach and what communications have happened so we'll we'll reference update that but just off just to, to my to my immediate knowledge um asbury green is the one that we've gotten the most information i believe as far as a descendant aspect um multiple individuals in fact um so yeah we'll we'll kind of i think we'll we can clean that information up um and make sure that's that's kind of clear for those planning discussions that'd be great and i felt as though there was some talk of a, a, a woman by the name of lynn mitchell that might have been associated with james taylor who's from kent county but that was still sort of under development um I know that there had been talk from the James Taylor Coalition folks that there may be a descendant of the perpetrator uh, of the of the or of the family where the lynching occurred, or I've I've forgotten now quite the connection, but a, a, a white descendant. Um, but it is unclear whether she, she would have an interest uh, uh, in speaking as part of uh, or providing any testimony as part of the, the hearing at, at this point. But there may be someone from sort of the other uh, perspective there. Thank you for that. And and did you say that there was another planning meeting on on the schedule? Like, is there a, a kind of a time frame we should try to work around? <laughs> yeah, let me look it up on my calendar. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Elizabeth, I just gave you access to the research folder so that through Google, you should be getting a note. Oh, great. Thanks. Amy, I, I I think there's been you know pretty good communication around the the planning for Southern Maryland, um, but I didn't know if if you had any you know specific requests in mind. I I know that we didn't kind of prepare to to state that necessarily, but um, was there was there anything that you you knew, or maybe that can just be a follow up point for us. Um, I don't know anything off the top of my head, but like many of these other counties, that they're all having meetings in the next week or so. Um, so I'll certainly ask that question specifically of them. Um, 
actually their meeting is at the same time as the PG County meeting. So Trish and I might need to divide and conquer. Um, and we'll, Trish and I will figure that out offline. So we'll make sure we have somebody at, at both. And then um, whoever goes to Southern can ask the question. Great. And I know we've, you know, uh, Heritage Associates have, have worked on the Calvert and St. Mary's case. There was already that kind of baseline of uh, research and that had been, I think, incorporated into some of the planning discussion. So yeah, whatever whatever kind of specifically comes out of that um, so we can target our, our efforts. Um, but it is, you know, since there is one in each county, um, it's maybe a little little less uh, overwhelming of a prospect um, in this timeline, but yeah, any any direction would help. Okay. Um, and I just, uh, I think David, you did follow up when I said I bumped into Eric at, um, Ashby Bay from Frederick County at a, an event, Lynching Memorial Project event in Baltimore County and just, he is looking forward to continuing the conversation as a descendant. And I think that actually Donna replied and said Donna was gonna follow up. So sorry, I'm my memory is being jogged as I'm speaking out loud. Sorry, Brett, but yeah. Donna did follow up. Uh, thank you, Amy, for the reference. She did, uh, did follow up with both Asbury and he referred her to another relative who has done a lot of extensive uh, research. <clears throat> and um, there's still some gaps that, that need to be filled. Uh, there, there's some missing pieces. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll send a note out to you on that. Thank you. David, I wanted to ask, do we have preliminary profiles on those who have been identified as descendants that we can share with various counties going into like the next planning meetings or what type of things do you kind of look for in terms of having guidance? Um, because I only have Frederick County to, to think of. So what are some things in the past that has been helpful for you or Heritage Associates Group? That's a really good question and, you know, I guess the the example that we've heard a lot about here is kind of the lack of known descendants that that's a concrete thing that <laughs> we, we certainly want to have a, a a baseline knowledge of going into a hearing um that then the research committee and heritage associates can support um there is a there is also a document a kind of a template document that we had set up several years ago to to help frame what what those needs and asks would be, um, so I think you've seen some of those completed. But I can we can kind of share that as well as a way of you know identifying gaps. Um, but I think you know really we want to know what what parts of the story or what perspectives are unknown um, that would support you know, the way that we presented at a hearing. And I know that's kind of a general way of saying it, but um, we want to tell the the best and most complete truth that we can um, about an individual's life, not just about the, you know, the events that, um, you know, connected to to the crimes themselves. So, yeah, I, I, I would welcome others. Yeah, I would okay. welcome others' perspectives on that because I know that was kind of, vague in general. Um, but again, I think what's outlined in the template as far as biographical, family information, community information, those are those are some of the main things that we want to be as as aware of and document as best as we can. Understood. Yeah, if you have that template and can share it, that would be great. And just um, to recollect what you're saying, if, if folks can share that, for instance, someone who was lynched was also a father or a cousin or had impact on the community in various ways that may have been bl blindsided by the circumstances of everything that happened, those will be things that you all will want to know or have that information. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I would, I would point to, you know, a lot of the, the chair's opening comments when it comes to the hearings as well, where, you know, part of the goal, I think a major part of the goal is, is getting to know and understand and, you know, humanize the individuals beyond just, you know, the crimes that were committed against them um, and give, again, give that kind of true assessment of the family, the community and, and what that impact is. So those perspectives aren't, you know, continue to be ignored in the historical record. Um, so yes, all of that. Understood. And my last question would be, are we moving, I know we've talked about this in a, a research committee meeting before, but are we moving forward with having folks to sign who do come forth as descendants that they are with the most truth that they can tell saying, yes, I am a family member of this person to the best of my acknowledgement. Are we still going to have that signature page or are we going to have a draft around that template for that? I think we had, we had talked in the last couple of months about what that process should look like, but have not really developed uh, a form per se or or something that kind of gets to the specifics that that you're mentioning there but i guess that kind of speaks to this this communication process leading into any hearing where you know we don't want to just hear from somebody a week ahead of time um we would love to have that preliminary conversation to i i hesitate to use the word verify but you know, to discuss the corroboration of uh, the family connections and again, how to best tell that in a truthful manner um, to frame the perspectives that people will share during the hearing. So there is, as far as, far as I know, that we have not developed a document or a form specifically for that purpose, but that's, that's kind of the idea around having strong communication um, and these touch bases ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, another question. So are we wanting to have the verification process be done three to four weeks prior to a hearing? Um, what does that timeline look like? Just so we're aware of that too. I think that's the timeline that we we put on it in that that was probably the May research committee meeting that we talked about kind of making that process a little bit more formal. So I would I would say yes, three to four weeks sounds like a good goal, if not more time. Um, but just being being realistic and I, I again I think the example that we would not want is is hearing from somebody in the one to three weeks ahead of time and just kind of hoping that we're able to have a conversation with them um, there needs to at least be time for a scheduled conversation and you know sharing of information yes amy yeah and i think what we also discussed or said it on is if somebody comes forward 48 hours before a hearing and they say that they are a descendant while they may not be part of that formalized part of the run of show where that's designated for descendants, um, they can certainly speak during that public period, that public open time more towards the end. So it's not that like they're being silenced again, they still have that platform and that opportunity, but it's more during that sort of vetted part of the run of show where, where we have much more solid confirmation that you know, folks are descendants or can trace their lineage back, but be it community or lineal descendants or um, so. I think part of what we're dealing with, Patricia and whoever else is wondering, is that we, the goal being to come up with some run of show in, in a satisfactory amount of time that that we can proceed confidently that we have something that's that's in place to represent uh, wh whoever the victims are and, and within that county 
uh, and at the same time, re recognizing that we cannot, nor should we specifically be responsible for vetting the actual authenticity of someone who would come forward to say that, yes, I'm a descendant of blah, 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 one side or the other, because that, that can be a very, very challenging, as certainly Brett and Donna would attest to, or any of us who do genealogy, to affirm one way or another within whatever truncated amount of time that we're dealing with. So as, as Amy says, in that public public section or public allowed of time, anyone could speak. And if someone at that time could say, could say that they're a relative, then that's fine as well. And subsequent to that, if we felt the need, we could take that on as a, as a situation. Uh, to uh, to explore, uh, but that's only really if it came up as an issue, which is a, a, which is to say, if someone conversely said that person is not a descendant, I know they're not a descendant. You know, they never come to family functions. I mean, there's something to that degree where we would feel encumbered upon, if that's the right word, to verify one way or another. So I think that's why we we have been challenged with trying to come up with a specific time to let someone in and move forward. Does that sound right? <laughs> Amy and, and David and yeah. Thank you, Chris. Reverend Diane, you're looking like you either don't agree or you don't understand what we're talking about right now. <laughs> I was muted. I, no, I'm fine. I was enjoying okay. the interaction and, and okay. thinking about the hearing and, and puzzling over all these complications and glad that people are anticipating them. Sorry if I had a frown on my face. It's probably my <laughs> You know, I... I had a stroke 10 years ago and I have some facial droop and it changed um, the way my face looks. Well, it was it was a happy quizzical look. It wasn't like, oh my God, <laughs> they do want a quizzical look. Oh, good. All right. I don't want to be frowning. <laughs> okay. So we are at 3.55. Um, I think at this point, uh, hey. if there are any kind of additional announcements from commissioner staff or members of the public or kind of final final questions this would be the time so i'll open the floor um my only announcement is that i'll be meeting with jimmy tomorrow um to just talk with him about any contingency plans if for some reason whether inauguration or World ends happens in January of next year. We can still be able to hopefully put something meaningful together. So I believe Jane, uh, Amy will be joining me for that. And then I also have included uh, Commissioner Maya and Commissioner Lindsay for that. Thank you. We will we will remain optimistic as much as we, as much as we can um yes so i know we've got we've got some some follow-up steps uh in terms of confirming um information that has already been compiled um sharing sharing the research template uh with individuals especially moving into the hearing planning process and coordination with with local committees and as well as some ongoing discussion around uh, process for descendant communication and, and formal invitation to hearings. So um, thank you all for your, your efforts thus far. And uh, I know we'll, we'll be in touch uh, with each other uh, regarding some of those next steps. Thank you, David. Thank you. 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 Thanks. Bye -bye.